24 seven is a long time when you're alone and those of us um, who are living through COVID-19 now are getting a little bit of a taste of what it's like um, mm. to be alone all day long or not get out for physical or other reasons. <laughs> Yeah, Janet, thanks for joining us. And um, what I want to do for the sake in, initially of all the people that, uh, that I've, I've mentioned Friendships Works to and, and, and because we've donated to you guys as, uh, as our kind of annual Christmas gift and holiday gift, tell us about Friendship Works and, and what you guys do. Okay, well, Friendship Works, um, our enduring mission since 1984 has been to reduce social isolation and improve quality of life and to maintain the dignity of older adults in the greater Boston area um, in the suburbs. And we've also been a mentor for other places throughout the country. Uh, our, we were initially funded actually by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in 1984 as a seed grant. And it was very interesting that a healthcare foundation funded an interfaith coalition um, whose mission was to reduce social isolation. But they were uh, seeing that older adults were living in place while their children and grandchildren were moving away and that people didn't fare as well when um, they didn't have their family and friends around and wanted to see whether volunteers could play some of the role that family and friends traditionally did and then did some studies and found that it was. And um, then the, our own community and donors, individuals and foundations have supported us since then and we've grown a lot. Our programs, um, you know, are most have to do with uh, both building long-term relationships, really being match matchmakers, um, like Fiddler on the Roof or something like that, as well as helping with short-term assistance and things that those of us who are able-bodied take for granted. So our one of the main programs we've had all these years is our Friendly Visiting Program, where we match volunteers 18 and older. Um, so they can be 18, they can be 90, they can be 50, they can whatever age of all backgrounds and faiths and uh, work conditions and incomes with an older adult in the community who has does not have a lot of social supports. They may have some family or friends, but that they really can use another um, friend in their life. 24 seven is a long time when you're alone. And those of us um, who are living through COVID-19 now are getting a little bit of a taste of what it's like um, mm. to be alone all day long or not get out for physical or other reasons. But this is the condition that many elders in our community who are hidden um, whether they're hidden behind their lace curtains or hidden behind tenements or tiny apartments or in dark spaces live with all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel really deeply that it's our obligation to our elders, but it's also that older adults have a lot of wisdom to share with us and that it is um, really, it's both a shame, but almost criminal for us not to be connected with one another for, for a variety of social justice reasons, but also just for relationships and learning. So we do make these matches and um, some people really are volunteers, the only person in their life who was a social connection. Um, and for other people, they may have a few other friends and um, we take great care in making matches, people's interests. If you love baseball, we might try and match you with someone who loves baseball. If you like a lot of intellectual conversation, if you just like movies, maybe you want to get out together if you're able to get out and uh, live somewhere nearby. And within the Friendly Visiting Program, which is building long-term relationships, we also have a pet visitation program, which is our outreach called Pet Pals, which is our outreach to um, older adults who are living in assisted living and nursing homes. And the same um, pet with his owner, his or her owner, go to the same assisted living or nursing home each week to visit and bring the unconditional love of pets to them. We have a um, music program, which is called Music Works, which is one of our newest pilots. It's been a few years where in elder buildings, but where people are living independently, where we bring music both uh, to Spanish speaking and English speaking people with a musician that we actually pay to be there who's really great with groups. Not for the music itself, although we did it because we know music is so powerful and so visceral, but because music as a way of connection also. So we've bought mm. some instruments that people play together. Um, we sing together, sometimes dance or move together, do some art while we're doing it, uh, share so that people who normally um, wouldn't know each other. Even, even if you live on the same hallway, you don't say hello, the architecture stuff that there's not necessarily so much trust or opportunity to get together through, through music, 
and through interacting with music and talking about what was your what did you play when what was the music when you got married what was the music when you were a kid what's the music your parents or grandparents sang to you as a lullaby when you were young what country did you come from with that we get people get to know each other in the building and then when they see each other, the elevator, all of a sudden they have a common bond and they get to know each other. So music for the beauty of music and the emotions it evokes, but also as a way of connection. And we do that in a number of buildings, mostly in low and moderate uh, income housing that, mm. that we do it in. The other programs that we also do some work uh, with haiku and bringing, um, it's called Relaxing Through the Arts, bringing nature inside to people who aren't able to get out and using poetry and sensory stuff to um, share our our memories and bring back the feeling of the outside in and, and actually mm. make that live and, and create create haikus and so forth together. In addition to the long-term relationships that we have, we also um, do things that are what I would say short-term or project-based. And the biggest part of that is our medical escort program. So many people don't go to medical appointments uh, when they really need to because they don't have somebody to go with them. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have a medical escort program where we do thousands of escorts each um, year, going with someone, staying with them, and uh, making sure they get home safely. We're not a transportation program, but we'll go on the modes of transportation, whether it's the city vans, if it's an Uber or a Lyft, if it's somebody's car, we may, some people do drive, mm -hmm. um, public transportation, a taxi. Uh, we go to the person's house, we make sure that everything's fine, help them down the steps if they need to, into the transportation if they need it. And we do this for people who have physical or emotional reasons. We know how stressful it is for many of us to go to the doctor if you have, uh, if you're concerned about your health, if you might get a bad diagnosis, or just hanging at a hospital is pretty stressful. So the volunteer goes with them, stays with them throughout, sometimes goes to an appointment, and sometimes you're waiting in the waiting room for a few hours and advocating for that person, making sure that they get their medications when they leave and getting them home safely. And that can be anywhere from one and a half hours if it's like a one-way trip to five, six, seven, eight hours as, as if any of the people who are listening to have had to take a loved one to the hospital and the stresses that it is and nobody should really go alone to the hospital, let alone if you're an older oh, yeah. adult and you're often ignored um, or not taken care of. And uh, you can, as one, our coordinator says that for people who are really stressed, he, you know, we try, our volunteers try and make it, uh, and do make it a friendly visit. It's like an outing. It can become a, something that could be extremely stressful, it can be, become a lovely outing with somebody and we can try and make people laugh and think about good things. And so that then when you do sit with your doctor, you actually can hear what they're saying and not just have all your stressors going on there. And then the other mm -hmm. part, the other program we have that does have to do with um, short-term assistance is called Friendly Helping. And that are things where people who want to volunteer every now and then um, and don't have to make a regular commitment, um, as well as the medical escorts, will do things whether both necessity of life and quality of life. So the necessity of life might be filling out a form if you're needing to, whatever it might be, but it's complicated, whether it's for new housing or something of that sort. It might be um, you know, getting to an appointment, but not a medical appointment. Um, but also things like cleaning your 85, let's say just as an example, and the, your closet's a mess and you can't get down on the floor anymore the way you used to, but you know there's things there. So somebody can come in and help organize, figure out what to throw out, where to put places so you can reach it, what to give away, um, and, and work with you on that. If somebody's packing for a move, mm. um, somebody's trying to decide whether or not to move, going to the cemetery on the anniversary anniversary of a loved one's death, who takes you but a friend or a family member, but that can be very meaningful to your, to your life. And so a volunteer can do that. We've had people take someone to visit their spouse in a nursing home. They're just a few miles away, but you can't get there on your own, which means you don't see your spouse who you've lived with for 50 years, but a volunteer can take you, allow you to stay and visit, and then somebody can get you home. So it's all sorts of things that 
um, those of us who are able-bodied take for granted if you think about it and um, but most of us are not independent and we're interdependent and so this is a way of having somebody in your life and for any of these programs it, it lets people know that they're not alone that there is someone else who really genuinely cares about them they're doing it as a volunteer um, we're not doing it as a paid service it's free to all of the older adults that we serve um, which I think is really important, particularly for the friendly visiting part, that there are often people say, why would somebody come to visit me? And it's because you're worthy. You know, you have, you know, you're a human being. You have things to offer. I enjoy coming to visit with you. It gives me, the volunteers will almost always say they get more out of it than they think that they, um, than they think that they're giving. And um, whether we've had a lot of people in their 20s and 30s who say, you know, nobody else remembers what I said, but my <laughs> friend, my older friend does because they're all into their own worlds. But, you know, Sue, who I visit with each time she comes and asks me something that I mentioned last time and that that's so meaningful to them. Um, so uh, that that's really, I've probably forgotten one of our programs here or there, but in general, you get the sense that what we do is about building relationships, building right. connection, making sure people know that they're not alone, that whether it is a friend, a new friend, because you're never too old to have a new friend, mm. um, and there's always something you can offer and that we try and make really good matches. And you also know that if you need something, you can call and that um, you're, you're calling somebody or calling an organization, Friendship Works, that really is gonna take into consideration who you are as an individual. We don't just make matches because somebody's available. We really look at who both the volunteer is and who the, older adult is and some older adults are volunteers obviously too right, so right. Um, but uh, we really personalize our work um as, as best as we can and we take great care in doing that interesting so you mentioned sue sue sue's not going to have her face buried in the cell phone when uh, when her 25 year old companion friend comes over correct they might actually have a <laughs> a blood and flesh conversation. <laughs> right. And we serve people who are 60 and older, 55 and older, if they're vision or hearing impaired. And we do mm. have kind of a focus on people who have um, vision impairment because often people will self-isolate and they don't need to, yeah. might need to adapt. So we want people to know that we're there. Um, for that and um well you did mention when you mentioned about the, the rest of us are getting to feel the isolation that they're feeling it is kind of miserable and, uh, to, and when you said that i'm thinking you know i was thinking about how miserable it was this morning i mean i do have my family but it's like you know to have the kind of wider community interaction is, is so much nicer you know you have your kids friends their parents and just the community people and i'm thinking wow six months straight of that or 12 months straight of that that like you're mentioning some of the people that you serve, that would be tremendously depressing. I can say, you know, you really, you, I think you, you wouldn't, you can't picture it until you've, I mean, I've had it for a few weeks now and it's like, wow, I'll multiply that by 12 or 24 and whoa, right? Incredible. And the physicality of it too. I think about that sometimes just from my earlier experience of like giving somebody a hug, holding their hand, watching television, you know, with them even and just, holding hands while you're doing that. Um, you know, most of many um, older adults who, who, those who have lost their spouse or were not married or something, may not have been touched for many years except for by a doctor or nurse. Like it's something mm -hmm. that, you know, that's not exactly gentle, but for somebody yeah. who kind of just think about not being hugged for a few years or not having somebody hold your hand or um, just to give you a, a warm kiss on the cheek or something like that and how meaningful that can be. And also for you to do that for somebody else to for you to really care about somebody else's life as we find as we get old, as people get older, part of it is feeling like you're needed. So the fact that there's somebody else who needs your friendship and that's mm -hmm. why we call it Friendship Works. We were, it used to be called Match Up Interfaith Volunteers, and but it's Friendship Works and um, it's a two-way street. Yeah, and yeah, sounds that way. The volunteers err on the side of listening, but it's also about sharing. You've had a grumpy day, so tell your 
your match, your friend, and they might have some advice for you or might just listen well and gone through that and uh, that we want these relationships to, to be two ways when they can be. Yeah, you mentioned that. I remember one time, I forget where I was, I was visiting somebody and, um, you know, it's an Italian thing. I think uh, um, um, you probably know a little bit about this, but it's, it's kind of weird to think about it now in the COVID era, but I remember meeting with somebody and I was just helped her out and I just met this woman, but she was like an older Italian woman who was probably in her late eighties. And before I left, I, I just instinctively went to give her a kiss on the cheek. Like she was one of my aunties or something. And she jumped up to the chance of that. I remember how like she looked so eager to do that. And now that you say that, I think I was remember thinking at the time, man, I bet you she hasn't, she probably used to do that all the time. It doesn't get that at all. Have a relative, a nephew or, or kids or whatever, you know, just kiss on the cheek. Like, like she would do it her family. So uh, you know, obviously in, in these COVID-19 times, it's an it's, it's interesting thought. But back then, you think about just, you're just missing that. I uh, wanted to ask you too, you mentioned all the programs. I and mean, when, I, when I had first learned about MatchUp, at, at initially, you know, it was kind of one thing. And then you added all these programs. I remember every time I get an email, oh, we have the pet program, we have this. And it's great that you have all these different programs that cater to people that maybe they can help once a week, they can help once a month, they can help when called, but they can't do regular schedule stuff. How do you go about deciding, okay, let's add a whole new program? Because, I mean, I imagine you got to have a good team of people to, because you don't want it to fail or, or to flop or to, or, to, or to not work correctly. So well, how do you decide to add a whole other program like the pet companionship program or the, you know, the, the take into the doctor type thing? How do you add a program like that? Like what goes into that and making it happen and, and bringing it to fruition? That's a great question, um, not one I get very often. Well, first of all, since we started, friendly visiting and medical escorts have been core programs that we've had. They've shifted, they've grown a lot, um, but they have been the core. And um, two things. One is you don't try anything, um, then you can't succeed. And my feeling is it's okay if we fail, um, if we've really done everything that we can to make it work, because... Um, there's no, you know, you don't know, part of it has to do with getting fun, having an idea or, or just looking at the world around you, knowing older adults visiting, seeing what might be missing in their life, what might be enriching, you know, at any age, what's enrich, and that's what I look at. What is enriching to people of all ages and what is visceral and what is missing? So with the pet visitation, we know that a lot of older, um, when I brought that on, you know, we did it as a pilot. I knew somebody who was really interested in pets and said, you know, this just really fits with us. There are a lot of older adults who, if they're living independently, they might have always had pets and now like walking their dog every day, they just can't do it. So they're not getting a new pet or the cost of keeping of a pet, they can't do it and they really miss it. And if they're moving into a, an assisted living or nursing home, sometimes they're not allowed to have a pet. But the unconditional love of pets is so important to so many people and they now at a certain age it becomes much more difficult either they're not allowed or becomes just difficult to take care of that pet so if we brought the love this love unconditional love of a pet to, to people's lives who want and need it and have had it how miraculous is that and also you bring their person with them so the person gets to meet the person you know the the elder and that's why it's a, a pet pal so it really came out of just knowing how important pets are to people and how many older adults didn't have that in their life anymore and how much they really missed it mm. and being able, it's not the same as having your own, but knowing that every week this person would get to see them and look forward to it and know that on Wednesday or Thursday or whatever it was, this person was coming, um, this dog was coming. We had mostly their dogs. We have a few cats that kind of act like dogs. We've had a bird, <laughs> we've had a uh, gerbil, uh, not a gerbil, um, a guinea pig, I think, but, mm. but most of them are dogs of different sizes. Um, we will bring them to to individuals, um, we'll bring them into a group in a nursing home, we'll bring them into people's bedrooms in nursing homes also, um, you know, just to spend some time and put them on people's laps or uh, we do this in a place that has a lot of people called the Boston Home where people have mm. Parkinson's and um, so we either have a very small dog that can be on their lap or a very large one where people can kind of <laughs> pet from their wheelchair uh, somebody. So that's the pet pals. The music program is also, I thought, well, what are the other pieces? So we have I was thinking, we have the friendly visiting, that's about friendship and, and whatever everybody has. So for some people, they're watching TV together. For other people, they're 
they're taking walks every time to get them out like a walking buddy for other people they're chatting about the news having a meal sharing a cup of tea whatever any one of us were all different and so that's that's uh, a, a very personalized then we have the pets piece and so well, what else what else is so visceral and core to the human being and one of the things is art and expressive arts and um, you know, like Grandma Moses or something, sometimes when you stop your harried day-to-day -day life and you're no longer working a full-time job or raising your children, is a time where you can explore things you didn't have time to explore. And for some people that is, uh, you know, starting to learn to paint or to draw or to write your, your, um, your autobiography, uh, write poetry, listen to music, maybe learn an instrument or just listen, you know. And I'd like to do the arts in general. We, we are integrating some other arts, but we thought, um, and we also got part of it was getting a grant, but we, we wanted to do the arts and somebody very wisely said, start with one thing. And we decided <laughs> yeah. to start with music. Uh -huh. And music is one of the most visceral parts of the human soul and of animals too. And um, it can, shift our mood completely you know when any of us know that you listen to a sad song a happy song uh you know you want to move you want to get up it, it it evokes so many things so music seemed to make a lot of sense and then we didn't want to do it as much as it, i appreciate when people bring music to any of our lives i wanted to make sure that our mission is about connection so that we weren't just bringing music to listen to passively, but that people would have a interaction, hand, eye, mm. body interaction with the music if they wanted to. People can sit and just listen, but to sing together, that's so powerful, to bring some drums so people can drum together and learn to drum, and then you're using your hands and your ears and you're creating music together, um, talking about the music. And so to me, it's like I'm trying to figure like what is, what does the human soul need? And we all need different things, but if, I'm, if I think Friendship Works is getting to the point where we, we're touching on some of the most important pieces of the human soul, um, and that's how I decided to develop the programs. And then the other thing, obviously, is um, we're a nonprofit, and so people have to support the work that we do, otherwise we don't exist. So um, we do write some foundation grants. We do have some partnerships with people who have supported us. And then there's individuals who support us. So if a program, if um, people feel that what we're doing is making enough difference and it touches their heart and they uh, wanna make a donation, you know, then that helps us continue. Otherwise we can't because we live, we live through, you know, people's generosity um, and it can be small amount, large amounts, um, very large amounts, whatever. Mm. Um, and we're actually having our walk. I just want to mention, um, oh, yeah. this will be our fifth year. We, um, we're in our 36th year of service. Um, and um, in some traditions, 36 means double life, a, a, you know, kind of a high. And um, the, but uh, we have a walk to end elder isolation that we've been doing this will be our fifth year it's the, i believe it's the only walk in the country that's a walk to end elder isolation or the first one and we actually did a walk this year it's going to be um a virtual gathering and so anybody from any part of the country or the world can join us it's may 17th and but now you can start teams if anybody's listening to this would like to get involved you can sponsor the walk we would welcome that mm. um and uh you can just write to us and ask us how or it should be on our website you can also create a team a family team a business team a church or a synagogue or a mosque team a, a dog team we have dog walker you know people we welcome all dogs to walk with us um and um and then people can donate what they can. They can donate five dollars. They can donate five hundred or five thousand dollars, you know, um, to your team or as an individual and join another team. And so that is our fundraiser this year. It's a little difficult because we had it all set to do to really mm. be walking, and now we've changed it and pivoted it to do virtual. But I think it'll be a lot of fun. Um, and you know, we have some tips of how to get involved. And so if anybody's interested, you can go to our website, which um, you can either look up Friendship Works, which is all one word with a capital F and capital W, or our website um, is www.fw4elders.org. 
again, F like friend, W like work, for the number, and elders.org, and uh, you'll see it, and you can look at our website. Or I'll, make, I'll make sure too, Jan, I'll put the link Thanks. wherever we post this uh, for the website and directly to, to that. So I'll make sure anybody that's watching this, whether I post this to our YouTube channel, and also if I put it, post it to LinkedIn and stuff, I'll make sure Thanks. those uh, those are there. Thanks. So yeah, it's, it's a great idea. So it sounds like from what you're saying that, you know, when you come up with a new program, uh, you know, people in the, the, the for-profit world might say, hey, you know, you're just kind of, you know, because, you know, they, they'll hire these gurus to come in and say, you know, why don't you just ask your current customers what they need? And it sounds like you just kind of observed the people you serve and saw what was kind of missing in their life. And, and you, and you, you plug those holes that this would be helpful. This would. And so you, you didn't, you didn't look to some, you know, obscure source for these new ideas on how to expand what you did. You, um, you, it sounds like you, you just kind of listened to the people you served and saw what was missing and, and, you know, it was right in front of you. Yes. Sometimes when we expand geographically a little bit, we do ask, you know, we do check in and talk to other organizations and elders. Is this something that's needed in the community? We're at the point where people are coming to us mm -hmm. um, because we have a model that after all these years, you know, really has been a, an, a model that works mm -hmm. for us and that can be changed. So sometimes we've helped other areas develop it, but mostly, um, you know, we now have had two towns surrounding us who have asked us to come in because, um, this is our expertise. Other people have other expertise, but our expertise is volunteer management, serving older adults and being creative and personal and with a real focus on reducing social isolation and also improving the quality of life and maintaining the dignity of elders. I mean, our, our ultimate vision is to end elder isolation and create connection for everybody. That's what I was going to say, you know, kind of in the last part of the segment of, about, about Friendship Works is I was going to say, you've done all this stuff. The next 10 years, where, where, do, where does Friendship Works go? Uh, what other places do you have to expand to, do you feel like, to really fulfill the mission you're talking about? Like what, what else is out there that, that you want to get to that, you know, maybe need some help getting there, but that you can see Friendship Works, we need to go in this direction to really, to really fulfill this mission? Well, is, is there stuff that I'm curious because I don't I'm just trying to think of where would you go like so to share with us like what, what you guys are thinking about in the right, you asked tough set. questions um, <laughs> great question. so we actually did about six seven years ago created a 10-year vision and uh -huh. we actually decided to double in size and impact and we actually did that in our yeah. five years which completed this past All right. year All right. yeah um, I can't believe we did it but we're serving twice as many people with more hours and times and developed so many programs we developed a music program in that time um, and now and we're taking a year to kind of just celebrate our 35 years we did and also to just settle in and to improve the quality of some of their things and mm. systems. And now we're just starting another five-year strategic planning process, which is just starting. So I don't have the full answer to you. <laughs> um, but some of the ideas okay. are there is to continue what we do just to serve more people. So some of it is continuing, you don't always have to do new things, but there are people, we have an aging population and many people who do not have family or family nearby or close friends um, and um, who will need um, or desire the support. And there are people who want to volunteer and to befriend somebody and have some older person in their life that they may not have or add that to their life. So I think is to um, continue what we're doing, doing it well. We don't have to grow a lot. I mean, it, sometimes you feel like, I think sometimes in this country, we feel like everything has to grow. And sometimes I think doing something well, knowing what you're doing and continue to do it is as important. Having said that, there is a need for us. So we hope the, to share some of our education and orientation and models with other people so that other communities can do this. And there are other communities mm. doing this. We are part of a network of National Volunteer Caregiving Network. Um, and we have been a model for that. And there are other programs that are doing really good things throughout the country. Not, you don't have the same package as we do, but maybe are doing parts of it. Hmm. Um, the other piece is I'd like to develop the arts component. Like I said, we started with the music. I'd like to develop that a little bit further and to grow that part of the program um, and see where that goes, maybe add some more movement to it, 
as well as the music or some visual arts for people who want to draw and find um, you know, artists who want to teach and we do pay our musicians and our artists and um, because we think that that's important, even though the volunteers don't, we have over 400 volunteers who are really volunteering, but the people who lead the music programs and who really can facilitate a group and um, we do pay them and we feel that artists are often underpaid and we want to make sure we're not part mm. of that. So um, it's a way of helping the world in, in another way. Um, no, that's great. It's a very low cost model when you think about it. 400 people volunteering, a lot of your work being done. I mean, that means the donation dollars go so far because you have all these people doing this for nothing, you know, because they want to. So it's a really impactful, you know, donation dollars to Friendship Works is pretty impactful considering, uh, you know, uh, what the team you have and how low, you know, if this is not a high cost, uh, you know, the labor force is not high cost here. This is really getting out in the community. Right. I mean, it does take, you're absolutely right. And that's why, you know, I think we've been successful and we know how to do it. I, I, mm. it does, um, it's not free at all. And that's why we need <laughs> we do have a, a fairly substantial budget because each of our coordinators, we have, you know, friendly visiting coordinators, a medical escort coordinator. We do take very seriously how we make a match. So we, um, people who want to volunteer do have to fill out a form. We interview every volunteer one-on-one. -on -one. We do a training, we do a quarry check, we do references to make sure that, um, the volunteer, you know, really, it, it, we're putting them into homes of people yeah. who are vulnerable. So we want to be careful. We go out and visit each of the elders, a staff member does. So we get to know the older adults so that we can make a good match. Um, so we take care and then we go and visit, go on the first visit with the elder. Um, the same thing with the music programs, we go and check out the buildings. And so there's a coordination, there's the recruitment, the training, the thanking, the supporting mm -hmm. the volunteers and then referring. But it is, uh, you know, very cost effective when you think about the numbers of people. We touch the lives of over a thousand people a year, you know, with the, the staff that we have. Um, the other thing in terms of growth and then, you know, maybe, I, and again, I don't know what, we'll, what exactly we'll do. And I'm happy to come back to your show and tell you once mm -hmm. we make the decision or in a year when, when we've started doing it. But it's to look at, like I said, we have some focus. Uh, we decided to have a focus on persons with low vision. But there are other populations, many of them, who may be more vulnerable than others. So um, we are also spending time with older adults who are LG, who are gay or lesbian or LGBTQ, because often, especially for elders today who grew up in a time where there's a lot of stigma and fear around that, that they are less likely to have family often that are supportive of them, or maybe even to have children. And so that's a population as well as um, different, you know, Spanish speaking. For us, right. it's Spanish speaking. We may look at a third language group um, during that time. Oh, that's great. And uh, I want to pivot now to, I mentioned to you before we, we started recording was that I just encounter so many people in my work as a financial planner, you know, when I'm talking about their goals, a lot of people will say to me, ah, you know, I want to do something different. And so I kind of want this segment to be more towards maybe talking about you and your career path. And then a little bit about, you know, about the responsibilities that you have. So a lot of people would probably be curious, you know, it's, let's say you take someone who's working corporate, they want to go to nonprofit or somebody graduating from graduate school and they say, man, I want to get in, I want to do what Janet's doing. Well, I mean, that sounds, that's my, that's my career goal. How did you get started? And tell me a little bit about your career history, getting up to this point where, you know, you're responsible for a lot of stuff, you know, people, money, other people. I mean, there's a lot of responsibility. How'd you get here? How'd you start that? My story is not as complicated as other people because <laughs> I've actually been with Friendship Works since it started. Uh -huh. um, so I. Um, but how'd you roll into that? Tell me about like before you even got there. How'd you pick that as the as the you know you said I want to work there. Like what's uh right. what, wait, what how'd you get there in the first place? Well, I always loved older adults. So okay. um and so it was certainly a population I was considering professionally working with. Um, I had a graduate degree in social work, but with a focus on community organizing mm. um, from uh, at Hunter College School of Social Work in New York. And um, before that had studied cultural anthropology. So I love the idea of culture and people and elders. Um, I had done some work for a few years um, doing youth work, being a youth leader and director of a youth program. Mm. And I had done some educational 
programming and administrative stuff. Um, when I was looking for work, elder work was something I did, and I started out doing a, um, uh, when I moved to the Boston area, I looked for, um, I started working at a drop-in center for mm. older adults, and it was like, and for others. So people who didn't have someplace to go, they drop in and have coffee and, well, you know, whatever day old stuff we could get and have a place for people to come in and to be welcomed and that's where I realized also the touch I remember an older woman who I I touched her shoulders at one point and she she kind of like almost was fearful and what it turned into she hadn't been touched in so many years that I started to massage her shoulders and she just her physicality like changed and I realized how important that was mm. and then a position I was doing that part-time and I was doing a few different part-time things teaching part-time and doing other things and then um, at the organization I was working we applied for this grant and I was one of the first two staff members hired to and I, at that point I was doing the friendly visiting coordination so I actually made the matches we go visit the elders and mm. with the volunteers and match them and then became the project coordinator. And um, a few years later, the organization, which was a housing organization, decided it was the early 90s that it wasn't a viable program really because it was a, a, the recession before this last recession, before COVID <laughs> depression, whatever. Um, and uh, so we, um, they asked us to close the program and I, uh, with a few other people that were on a committee, not a board, decided that we felt what we were doing was really important and there had been so many other programs that had just closed because mm. they weren't making it that we would try and um, make it on our own wow. and we got uh, somebody offered us a, a small tiny space a boiler room in the basement of an assisted living and it was a pink boiler room <laughs> and with enough room for like two days <laughs> yeah, it just was with enough room for two desks with a set coming in and a volunteer and we incorporated with the help of somebody who I didn't know anything about any of this um, became our own 501c3 and I became the director mm -hmm. and we started to create our own identity and um, it was myself and one other part time person and um, a full time person and um, we just started to build and slowly, you know, built match up and um, moved a few different times because of real estate in Boston. We outgrew that space and that space was needed by the building we were in. And we went to another building, which then was torn down to build luxury condominiums. And we went to the YWCA for a few years and then they were reinventing. And now we've been where we are for about 12 years and love it in downtown Boston, but we serve all of Boston, every neighborhood. We try and be near public transportation and we've just, um, built our work because of the belief of other people, because of the incredible kindness of the volunteers, because of the donors that we have, and because what we're doing is really making a difference in people's lives. And my job has changed, even though I've been the director for a number of years. Um, I didn't used to have this color hair before when I was, <laughs> but I've changed, as I say, I'm aging in place. Um, but um, I am, is, I get to be creative. Um, certainly my, my role when we were two people is very different than my role when we were seven people than my role is now that we have 20 people on staff um, and that we've developed the programs. And if I get a little tired of board, then I build a new program. <laughs> um, and then have the challenge of some really down times in terms of, you know, fundraising and keeping it in scary times and times when things are going a little uh, better and we've had some a few really very generous donors extremely generous that have really helped us to grow to where we are now and then many donors of all sizes and then um, a really wonderful board of directors that cares and believes in what we do so it's really a team effort and wow. it's really the elders who and it's also the older adults who trust us who welcome us into their homes because I feel like they're hosts if you invite an older person if you invite someone who was once a stranger into your home they're hosting us they're sharing their lives and then the volunteers who bring the best of themselves when they volunteer to the work and really care about it and change the life the whole world for somebody else i, I will say that 
a number of months ago, just to give your listeners a little chance to, to understand is that, um, as I said, maybe now people have a little taste of it. Or some people are enjoying being home, some people are having a really hard time mental health wise, or just not mm. seeing people. Um, you know, I heard there was a, a man actually, a volunteer who's in his 40s, I think, who's visiting with somebody who didn't retire that long ago, but really doesn't have a social circle, you know, when he left work, very much alone, needed some support in terms of just getting his banking and, and other things done, but they both love baseball and they talk about it. And um, his older friend uh, gave him a book of uh, a Red Sox book. Uh, and I think of Jack Remy and wrote into it, he said, thank you for giving me my life back. Oh, wow. So, you know, people who, because he feels like there's somebody who's there for him now and helping him with practical things in his life, but also helping him remember who he was because he was losing sight of that by being alone so much and, and feeling alone in the world and feel like now he can have some joy and remember his own gifts and that this volunteer just by going, not just, but by being there for him and then talking to him on the phone and everything has made him feel like a valuable human being again. And I think that's true, you know, over and over and over again. And mm. um, our friendships are matches last anywhere from one year to over 20 years. The average is about two and a half years. Um, but once somebody is a friend, they, they forget that we match them. They just become friends. And uh, yeah, well, Yeah. Did you, um, you know, when you were early on, I imagine, you know, bootstrapping this thing, and maybe you've talked to other executive directors or the same way, but when it's early on and you're getting going, is it like one or two donors that really like keep you going in the early days? I have to imagine you don't have this distribution list. We know back when you first started the thing with two of you in the boiler room, it wasn't, you don't have an email list of 10,000 people and a distribution list. I got to imagine it's one or two donors that really believes in you that gets it going. And is that, is that how it often works with a, a startup nonprofit, sort of like what you were in I and mean, what you were doing as a startup, you know, it was, it was. Well, know, we was, started really was, we had a, a actually foundation grant um, when oh. we were deciding that we wanted to try it on our own. Mm -hmm. I learned how to do grant writing and I had never done that before. Important skills. Um, <laughs> and because the organization, we weren't allowed to do our own fundraising. So the bigger organization we were with had done that. And I wrote a grant and um, it was in the winter. I think it was the night before Christmas. I got a call from, uh, I think it was the Boston Foundation. That's said they were giving us $25,000. Oh, and wow. to me, that was like, I mean, now $25,000 still means a lot to us back then it meant the world, both the affirmation that uh, a fairly large foundation really believed in us and that we actually had money that we could go. And uh, obviously we're, we're getting paid very little back at that time. Um, still nobody gets paid a lot, but we get paid more than we used to. Um, and um, that is long, along with some of the grants that had been given to us before we had enough money to, to get going. So at the beginning, we really were mostly more of our money came from foundation grants and then from, as well as individual gifts, but not huge individual gifts. Now, um, we have a little bit more of a balance and we need more individual gifts because there are only so many foundations that actually, you know, different foundations or, or corporations have certain things they care about. They might give to children's sports or they might give to, uh, you know, animal rights or, you know, people have their own things. And there's a limited amount of foundations that give to elder services and particularly to something that we do. So we know there's a cap on that. There's no cap on the number of people that can give us, you know, if they care about what we're doing and they know about us can um, give us a donation once or twice a year or participate in a walk or a holiday gift or, you know, maybe they're retired, you know, part of the retirement fund or something. So we do have, there are a few individuals who they're, they're, you know, they're, they have the ability to and have chosen Friendship Works as a place to, um, as one of their larger philanthropic givings. And then we have many people who give of, uh, you know, I, I sometimes get a gift of $1 in, in the mail from an elder and that, no, it doesn't go as far as, you know, $10,000 for sure, but boy, that means something to us that they actually did that. And then we have a lot of gifts of 25 and 100 and $250 and they, they add up. I mean, you see it in political campaigns where 
if you get a lot of people to give and they give annually or um, or you can do monthly giving, you know, so a little bit gets taken out of your checking account, you know, $10 a month or $20 a month. Um, so people give of different amounts and, and it's an area we have to work on. I don't have a development director right now, so that's really hard because so staff are helping and I'm the major mm. person, we have a communications person, but um, there's not a lot of um, fluff at Friendship Works. So the money people donate really does go to um, our programming, most of it, and obviously helping to pay salaries of people who make those matches happen but it, it's really all about our, our program um so hopefully we're getting more people to know about us and that we can continue to be here for the next generation for this generation and during these times it's hard because i know everybody's struggling but mm. um, we're hoping we're really hoping and and we're working at and we don't know what the future brings that we don't have to cut back but that we can actually at least continue with what we're doing if not grow some more so we can be there for as i said people who are struggling now or alone now, as well as for the next generation of people that they'll know that there's somebody there for them. You were talking to somebody who wanted to eventually follow your career path or be where you are. Maybe they, with so many, you know, so many more nonprofits these days, maybe they have a bit more of a, I don't know, a corporate uh, um, job track, you know, where they could get in earlier. You had to kind of build this, uh, all this thing yourself. It wasn't, it wasn't easy. Um, what would you advise somebody that wants to do what you do for whatever their passion is? You know, they, they, what, 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 what do you think they need to know? Um, besides obviously being passionate about, like you were passionate about working with elders. So we hope that that precursor exists. You know, you don't go in this field for the money, as you know, you go in it, you obviously have a passion for this. So that being understood, what does somebody, what does someone need to know that wants to be you? First of all, you, you never do it alone. I didn't do it alone. I did it with, you know, people around and, you know, ask, you know, support and, and things like that. I did. I, I think the biggest thing is perseverance, you know, um, following, following your heart, understanding what you do well and admitting what you don't and where you need somebody else to partner with you. I mean, there are people who are solo goers and for a while I had to do that, but, you know, I have my strengths and I have my areas where I'm not so good. So, um, finding, if you're doing something new, I would say find, know where your strengths are and admit where you're not and find somebody else to pair with you or something to 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 match that so you're a little bit more of a whole um, and you can go forward and have that. Um, and then staying with it as long as you're able to. I mean, there are times you just say enough is enough. There've definitely been times in my career where I go, oh my gosh, you know, we're not gonna make it. It's, and then I get re-energized. I'm like, I can't do this anymore. Like in 36 years, <laughs> believe me, there've been those days and sometimes months on end. And then you go, and then you get that fight back and you go, no, I really, if I don't do this, who will do it? So you have to believe in it. You have to want to do it. You find people who are, might be a mentor or just uh, talking to, you find the people who support it. If you want to change your career and you're going into another, field and already exists, I say volunteer also, um, if you're able to and can afford to, and even if you can't, sometimes that's the only way to get into it. I've, I've uh, had people, you know, they were more younger people, but who were looking for jobs right away, but didn't have enough job experience, for instance. But I think even for older people or people of any age who are transitioning, is you need to build some experience so somebody will hire you. So it's one thing if you're starting something on your own, it's another thing if you wanna be hired into a field you haven't been in. So maybe getting involved in an organization at whatever level, a few hours a week, you know, becoming, taking a role, learning what it's really like, maybe you think you wanna do it and then through your experience realize that's not really what I wanna do. Um, but if you have particular skills, like I said, and, and maybe volunteering those skills for, six months a year and then you have the background and you also have somebody who will give you know your credibility um in that and you've also learned something so i i always obviously i believe in volunteering since i run a volunteer organization <laughs> an organization that's based on that but i grew up that way too and I, I think um it just never hurts to volunteer uh and then and then you gotta if you're starting something from scratch you have to stick with it and not let the when it's down you can feel really down and you just want to run away and then you have to wake up the next morning and say i'm gonna try one more day uh, 
just like anybody who starts a small business, you, you sometimes do it by yourself, but then, and sometimes you stay, some people have their own business and it's they themselves, but, um, and you build and you slowly build and depending on the timing and sometimes you build a small team around you um, and, you, and you keep going until you, um, uh, unless you decide that you can't or that it wasn't a good idea to begin with and there's no shame in that. How do you, um, and I guess one that we get near the end, how do you build a good team of people? How do you attract people in a field where you can't offer them, you know, stock options, you know, well, how do you build good team? Where do you find them? And how do you, how do you keep a good, a good team working together in, in your, in what you do and in, in your field? Well, I have to say we have a wonderful team at Friendship Works now. Really, I can, especially going through this, I like every day, I'm like so grateful. I count my blessings about everybody who's on staff, about how the, what how caring they are and about the the variety of skills that we have and how we carry each other. And then um, and then sometimes looking at what we're missing. So we were missing a graphic designer, nobody. And I said, well, let's find somebody, you know, maybe right now and this, somebody wants to volunteer, maybe we can give somebody a stipend, maybe we can give somebody the experience, maybe eventually they can come on staff, you know, what are we missing? I, I think in terms of building a team and you never, you can't always get it right. You know, we've had some stronger teams over the years and some weaker ones, but generally we've had a good team, both a board team and a staff team, more or less. I think you find people first who care about your mission. If they don't care about what you're doing, um, then they're not going to put their heart and soul into it. Mm -hmm. So, and it's hard to come to a job where you're not getting the pay the big bucks, you know, if you don't care about it. And then you trust people, um, but you also give them opportunities to grow, and you learn where they want to grow, and you give them the support as best that you can. In some years, you can give more than others, depending how much is on your own plate but you give them the support to grow. And I think also when you can, you give authority. So I, I think a lot of people get really stressed um, at jobs. People have a lot of responsibility, but no authority um, in the hierarchy of things. So yes, ultimately as the executive director, I'm responsible. And so I do wanna have oversight, but maybe the first year I look at everything, if it's a new employee and check things out. And then after that, I go, I, I hired you because you're the expert. You know, I want to hire somebody who's smarter than me, you know, who knows in certain areas like that. Maybe I've done it. I've done a lot of the pieces of the work, not all of it. But I want to hire the best that I can afford, that I can, at, you know, um, that's out there who are smart, who are good, who care. and. Um, not give them full authority, but let, <laughs> but let them fly, let them fly, let them, let them make some mistakes, um, as long as they're not killer mistakes, you know, um, because we don't grow without that, and um, not have too heavy a hand, um, and, um, and let them know that you need them, That's and, um, yeah. and I, I, you know, try and work together, and it, it's not perfect, it's kind of like, a, you know, a little bit of a, family that's sometimes dysfunctional and sometimes more functional <laughs> but um i think if people know you care about them that i think that makes uh, a difference. parting advice about anything we talked about to whether someone wants to be a volunteer somebody wants to be you somebody wants to wants to just be more involved in a, in a cause that's important to them anything well what would, what would your final advice to be with to people be uh i guess Maybe uh, anything you want to say, but also maybe an angle of, you know, I guess we, we could all be doing a little bit more for other people, me included, especially. Um, what's, um, what do you say, what do you say to the, to the, to the general public? What? Well, I think we're finding out right now what really is, is who the essential workers are and what's really essential. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, in our very, and I, I don't mean to say this in too negative a way, in our very extremely capitalistic society, and there's nothing wrong, and I know you're financial, you know, we all want to have, we are a capitalistic society, and that's fine, but it's gone to the extreme where sometimes the 
what we value is not, we're finding out what's really important. The indispensable workers are the ones who are working with people, the ones who are making a difference, the ones who are on the front line, the ones who are making sure that people are fed and cared for and who are taking the risks and often are the really underpaid people. So mm. obviously I want people in the human services to be paid better and to be respected and be given their dignity and um, honored because they need to. And I think if there's any time that we see that now, it is those people. And to be part of making a difference in the world, leaving your mark um, on one other human being, you know, or to a group of human beings, a positive mark that um, you've lifted the boat a little bit is a privilege and it's an honor. Um, and that to try and, that doesn't mean we all don't have our own egos and we don't care, but to really sometimes think about the other person and how much do we really need um, to have a good life and at the end of our life be able to say that that uh, we, we honored others. So I think if people have the inclination to help, whether it's as a volunteer and you're doing other work or to change your career or to support financially or to give a few hours a week, you know, everybody's got their own life, their own desires, their own loves. Um, to follow it, but to try and find something that you can do to make sure what you're doing is not harming the world or harming others, I think do no harm. And to really think about, am I not doing any harm to think about the other side? And then to do something that, that lifts uh, a human being or lifts the world or lifts our values as, as a country so that, um, because I think we're all in this together. And, um, that's what we want other people to do for us if you know we're in that situation i think all of us are just a few steps away from being in each other's shoes mm. uh, and it's just luck sometimes or who parents you had or whatever that brought you to where you are so i don't know i'm just grateful for the privilege of working with uh, really good people people bring the best of themselves to their work and to their volunteering and to know that every day, people at Friendship Works are making a difference in in, um, in someone's life. That's a privilege. That's great. Well, thanks for sharing that. Uh, everyone, Janet seckel Sarati, Executive Director of Friendship Works in Boston, serving uh, isolated elders. Really, thank you for your time today. We're going to put links down below to all the stuff that you talked about, including you know, how to find your site, how to donate, how to get involved with the virtual walk. Um, it was just, it's really been awesome to finally connect and, uh, I think you shared some good wisdom today. So hopefully a lot of people will find this, find this helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you.